I study the brain for a living. And my wife, Bree, is also a neuroscientist. This, this makes for very interesting conversations at home. <laughs> and you have two neuroscientists, two cats, and then recently a four-month-old baby. We talk a lot about decision-making at our house, and we wonder why it is that one of our cats decides every day to take his favorite toy and drown it in his water bowl, every day. And we wonder, of course, like many of you do, what in the world our spouse could possibly have been thinking when they decided on this or that particular action, right? Very common. So my perspective that I bring to these discussions is a laboratory scientist who studies decision-making, actually, in the lab, in animals. And I am very struck as I work with animals how much bottom-up, what I'm going to call for this lecture, bottom-up influences influence our decision. Things like hunger, thirst, fear, anxiety, hormonal cues, and in humans, cultural biases and cognitive biases that we're not even aware of. So all of these bottom-up drives that influence our behavior. Now, Bree, by contrast, works with a group under the Dean of Research Office at Stanford in designing really excellent online courses for very busy professionals like all of you. And her group has to maintain what I'm going to call top-down influences. They have to have goals in mind, long-term goals. They have to make plans month by month how to produce an excellent course. And they have to adapt to contingencies and unexpected accidents that happen along the way. And importantly, her group has to ignore as much as possible all of those bottom-up things that I described in the previous slide. So these are the two poles of our conversations, frequently bedtime conversations. This is pillow talk at my, at my home. <laughs> uh, and what we really wonder about is to what extent are we really in control of our behavior in terms of our long-term goals, and to what extent are we really driven by these bottom-up influences that we don't even appreciate. So like good scientists, uh, we want to get data. We want to go look and see what kind of evidence is out there. So one of the primary examples, uh, to my mind, of bottom-up influences on behavior is the story of this young man here, Charles Whitman. I imagine not many of you have heard of you, him. Have any of you ever heard of Charles Whitman? Charles Whitman, in the 1960s, was the first of the modern era, era of shooters. He was the so-called Texas sniper. He was an ex-Marine. He was an undergraduate at the University of Texas. Very good student, by the way. And in 1966, he climbed to the top of the tower at the University of Texas with a high-powered rifle, and he shot and killed 19 different people, wounded 38 more, and before turning the gun on himself and killing himself. Earlier that morning, he had actually killed both his wife and his mother with a hunting knife. And we ask ourselves, how could this happen? Why? What is going on in that person's head? And it's interesting because Whitman actually left a diary behind. He recorded many of his thoughts and feelings as he went through this process. And he's very aware of what was going on. You can read much of this online, but I'll just put a couple of quotes that are particularly interesting for you up here, poignant. Whitman writes at one point, it was after much thought that I decided to kill my wife, Kathy, tonight. I love her dearly, and she has been as fine a wife to me as any man could ever hope to have. I cannot rationally pinpoint any specific reason for doing this. And then a little bit later he writes, if my life insurance policy is valid, please pay off my debts, donate the rest anonymously to a mental health foundation, maybe research can prevent further tragedies of this type. So this is a person who at some level was aware of the violent impulses inside him. He had actually been to see a psychiatrist at the University of Texas once, but never went back. But at some level, he was unable to control these bottom-up influences. And his remark here about an autopsy turned out to be really prescient. So in fact, an autopsy was done. And in Whitman's brain, down near the middle of the brain, a, a tumor, a cancerous tumor was discovered impinging on these three structures, the thalamus, the hypothalamus, and the amygdala, all of which are known to be very important for emotional regulation. Now, did this tumor cause Whitman's actions? We'll never know that because this is a one-off observation. But to me, it's very profoundly suggestive, and it's suggestive that even when we have conscious awareness of what's going on, many times these bottom-up influences from the middle of the brain are too much for us to control. Now, Bree, if she were here, would say this. She would concede, okay, this guy was out of control, probably due to this remarkable tumor. But Bree would consider all of us to think of another 
um, another group of people, a much larger group of people, who struggle with very serious bottom-up influences, but manage to exert top-down control and keep them under management. And the people she's talking about are addicts, uh, people who are addicted to drugs or to alcohol, and join groups like Alcoholics Anonymous in an attempt to regain control of their lives and regain control of their addictive behaviors. For those of you who don't know, Alcoholics Anonymous is a social group therapy movement within the United States where addicts come together once a week to share with each other their struggles and report how they're doing in managing their addictive behaviors. Furthermore, they're paired one-on-one -on -one in a buddy system so that every person has another buddy they can call at any time of day or night uh, to, when they feel on the verge of giving in to some of their addictive behaviors. So in, in addiction, basically, the natural reward systems in our brain run crazy. And natural reward systems that we all have uh, become out of control. It's sort of like pouring gasoline on a fire of these bottom-up impulses. So think about the reward system in your own brains. And think about how difficult it is to resist the temptation of something like this. Now this is a serious weakness for me. I could eat all of those in one sitting, right? For you, it might be chocolate, it might be ice cream, it might be shopping at one of the high-end malls here in Shanghai, right? But in addiction, this natural drive toward pleasure that we all have becomes out of control and it compromises people's ability to hold jobs, to support themselves, to support their families. And all of us here know cognitively, and many of us know personally and painfully, the destruction that this can cause. The human costs that, that, this, that this results in are, are just um, unfathomable sometimes. And the, one of the most courageous and important things that any human being can do is to try to fight their addictive tendencies and to regain control of their lives and regain top-down conscious management of their behavior. So in the end, this suggests kind of a hypothesis. Uh, Bree and I agree, maybe we're both right. That's a good thing for us to agree on, right? That we're both right. Maybe we're both right. Maybe every person in this room, our behavior and our decisions are a combination of these bottom-up impulses and top-down control. And maybe it simply varies from person to person, uh, the ratios of those, how involved they are in decision making. So of course we're scientists and we want to go consult the best scientific research and see whether there's support or lack of support for this hypothesis. And some of the very best scientific research was done at Stanford in the 1970s by Walter Mischel and uh, Ebby Evison, and it's the famous Stanford marshmallow test. So what, what Mischel and his colleagues did was invite three to five-year-old kids, and of course their families were along and approving of the experiment, to participate in an experiment. These kids came from the Bing Nursery School at Stanford, and the experiment was as follows. Each child was taken one at a time into a room with a table and a chair and a plate with one marshmallow on it, a very tasty treat. The child was told, you can eat this marshmallow now if you want to, or you can wait. I'm going to leave the room for five minutes. That's the experimenter is going to leave the room for five minutes. And if you haven't eaten the marshmallow when I get back, then you'll get two marshmallows, okay? And it's a test of self-control, right, in three to five-year-old kids. And I'm gonna show you movie clips just because they're amazing to watch of these kids trying to try not to eat the marshmallow <laughs> and see which one you identify with the best. So did I tell you to give you another one? Okay, now you can have both. You need them. <laughs> Reward system going crazy, right? It's really good. So the results of the test is that there's a spectrum of self-control at ages three to five. Uh, I, a few of the kids ate the marshmallows immediately. Many made it part of the way through, and about 30% actually completed and got, got 
the, the two marshmallows. Uh, so it turns out that the most important thing about this was not that particular result per se, but the fact that that is predictive of certain important things later in life. It turns out the amount of self-control kids show at three to five years here was correlated with SAT scores in high school. It was correlated with the absence of certain adolescent behavioral problems that those of us who have been parents of teenagers know all too well. It's even correlated with activity in the brain during middle age uh, in circuits that are known to be important for self-control. So it looks like there are real individual differences that are predictive from an early age. But the, excite, the exciting thing is that neuroscientists and psychologists are now armed with new tools from brain imaging, from mindfulness studies, and from innovative brain games that give us tools to teach kids and teach adults how to learn habits and develop neural circuitry and skills for controlling their own impulses. So I started out this talk with this question here, are we free to decide? And I think maybe the answer is that it's not yes or no, free. But maybe it's the, the answer is that we become more free as we become more aware of our bottom-up influences and biases and prejudices and work to exert top-down control and become free of those things. So this is a kind of a paradox, right? That freedom is wrapped up in control, self-control. How is that? How do freedom and control go together?